Part four, chapter thirty of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty Critical Periods in the History of the Scottish Church. It was an old Scotch custom for those who believed in a cause to band themselves together by a sacred oath to support it to the death. Into such a covenant the barons entered, in fifteen fifty seven, to support the first preachers of reform in fifteen eighty one when there was a dread of the revival of popery the first formal and written covenant was drawn up by john craig chaplain to james the sixth which entered into a full description of the religious errors which were to be combated and was signed by the king and by the people in all ranks prelacy was one of the things it denounced in 1596 this covenant was renewed in 1638 when charles i tried to force the english liturgy on the scotch people a bond was again drawn up condemning all episcopal innovations and was sworn to with the wildest enthusiasm in the grey friars churchyard edinburgh it bound its subscribers quote, to adhere to and defend the true religion and forbear the practice of all innovations already introduced into the worship of god and to labor by all means lawful to recover the purity and liberty of the gospel as it was professed and established before the aforesaid innovations some signed with tears on their cheeks and it is even said that some wrote their names with their blood and when charles greatly exasperated tried an appeal to arms the scotch troops went forth under the gallant leslie with these words stamped in gold on their colours for christ's crown and covenant charles however wisely retired before coming to blows another document drawn up by commissioners of the english parliament and the westminster assembly and by committees of the scotch estates and the general assembly was called the solemn league and covenant for reformation and defence of religion the honour and happiness of the king and the peace and safety of the three kingdoms of scotland england and ireland this covenant was especially explicit in repudiating the episcopal form of government it was approved by the general assembly and by the scotch people by the westminster assembly in sixteen forty three by the scotch parliament in sixteen forty four and by Charles the Second at Spey in sixteen fifty, and at Scone in sixteen fifty one. With his usual hypocrisy, Charles at the Restoration sixteen sixty, denied his oath to the Scots, which led to another war in which the Covenanters were crushed after suffering the most cruel oppressions and persecutions. It was only after the accession of William of Orange sixteen eighty nine that adherence to the covenants ceased to be a crime even after the full recognition and establishment of presbyterianism in scotland many of the more fanatical covenanters refused any sanction to a government which upheld episcopacy in england and did not conform all its acts to the gospel this stricter party formed themselves into what is now called the reformed presbyterian church the jealousy of the scotch for their covenants is a remarkable evidence of the extreme rigor and conscientiousness of their religious opinions the scotch reformers were trained at geneva the fountain of presbyterianism and the scotch reformation was not a state policy as in england prompted by the selfish ambition of the rulers but was a radical renewal of the church on the basis of holy scripture the scotch people became strongly attached to the presbyterian form of government and associated with a good deal of justice prelacy with absolutism in church and state but they had many hard struggles before all danger of the re-establishment of episcopacy was passed when james the sixth reached manhood and got the reins of the government in his own hands he strove with great bitterness to overturn the constitution of the scotch church in sixteen hundred he secured the appointment of three bishops who however were not recognized by the church then he prorogued the meeting of the general assembly and when nine presbyteries met in defiance at aberdeen 
he banished eight ministers to remote charges and six to france Quote, next followed the alienation of church lands and revenues and their erection into temporal lordships the re-establishment of seventeen prelacies and the restoration of the bishops the immense step was taken of recognizing the king as absolute prince judge and governor over all estates persons and causes both spiritual and temporal end quote. thus james drew the chains tighter and tighter round the church packing the presbyteries and general assembly until in sixteen eighteen under threats of violence the general assembly of perth passed five acts which enforced kneeling at communion observance of holy days episcopal confirmation private baptism and private communion these acts were confirmed by parliament on black saturday august fourth sixteen twenty one when charles i came to the throne in sixteen twenty five he relentlessly pursued the policy of his father he pressed the claims of the crown even further than james forced through the convention an act anent his majesty's prerogative and apparel of churchmen sixteen thirty three which greatly enraged the people erected dioceses and courts circulated the book of canons sixteen thirty six which gave to the church a complete episcopal organization besides containing many insulting references to presbyterianism and under the influence of laud ordered the adoption of the english prayer book footnote the prayer book which charles attempted to force on scotland was the english liturgy modified by laud mainly in the direction of the roman ritual and note this was the last straw the anger of the people knew no bounds sunday july twenty third sixteen thirty seven was the date announced for the new liturgy at st giles cathedral edinburgh no sooner did the dean arise to officiate than jeremy geddes or anne main threw a stool at his head which was the beginning of an uproar in which lindsay the bishop was with difficulty saved from the violence of the mob a similar riot took place in greyfriars church when the bishop of argyll tried to use the book protest after protest was sent to the king the nobles joining the ministers in asking for redress then sixteen thirty eight was drawn up the solemn league and covenant mentioned above in which the subscribers pledged themselves to recover the purity of the gospel as it was professed before the episcopal innovations an assembly met in glasgow november twenty first sixteen thirty eight which though dissolved by the king's commissioner continued in session until it annulled the acts of the assemblies between sixteen o six and sixteen twenty eight condemned the service book book of canons high commission court deposed the bishops declared episcopacy to have been abjured in fifteen eighty condemned the five articles of perth and fully restored presbyterian government the king was obstinate but finally in sixteen forty one yielded to the wishes of his scotch subjects but the war between prelacy and presbyterianism was renewed under charles the second who had not learned wisdom by the failure of his father this was the second eclipse of the scottish church from sixteen sixty one when episcopacy was restored by proclamation to sixteen eighty nine when william the third of orange brought religious liberty to the british nation the presbyterian church ceased to exist as the national church of the scots her ministers were ousted from their parishes persecuted and exiled put to death even with accompaniments of cruel torture and their spirits cowed and broken by interminable assaults and indignities in sixteen ninety under william the very soul of tolerance and wise statesmanship and his adviser carstares the first general assembly was held since sixteen fifty three the rejected ministers were replaced prelacy declared an insupportable grievance the act of supremacy rescinded and the presbyterian government of fifteen ninety three restored the episcopal ministers who intruded into the parish churches were allowed to remain by acknowledging the confession of faith 
and the covenants were not made a part of the settlement these concessions were far from pleasing the extreme party the heroic covenanters as they came to be called who held out as a separate body until their union with the free church in eighteen seventy six presbyterianism seems ingrained into the very heart of the scotch people and they have gone through sufferings untold rather than be deprived of their favorite polity it has made them self-reliant firm independent it has stimulated every energy of their minds and wherever they have gone they have carried with them that rare union of intelligence and piety which is the characteristic of the race End of chapter 30